it's wonderful for Padma and I and our singer friends to be here today, down through the many decades from when Yogananda came in 1920 through uh, our own founder, who was his direct disciple, Swami Kriyananda. Throughout this country, our singers and Kriyananda and Yogananda have appeared in, in Unity churches, in science, uh, Church of Religious Science, uh, places down through the ages. So we, we feel very uh, at home. Padma and I, uh, throughout the year, will sometimes be invited out to, let's say, Unity in Fort Townsend recently and other places to share. And we always feel very much at, at home. Ours, all of us, in our aspiration to feel that which we cannot see but which we know on a heart level have come together. And we are a force for good in the world. When I look out over my lifetime and over the world today with so much that's going on, we need bearers of light like you and I to stand up for the reality that there is only one. In Yogananda's autobiography, he made the statement in relation to our material needs, food, shelter, etc. He said, for hunger too, for, I'm sorry, for wisdom too, we hunger. I think of us, all of us, born after, let's say, World War II, baby boomers or whatever else the other generations are called. And when I look at world history, and I have traveled around the world as well, I realize, I have come to realize that we have been privileged to be born in a time like no other time in recorded history. I'll just call it America to keep it simple. In America since those times, we, we have enjoyed relative prosperity, health, and security such as no other nation on the earth today and throughout recorded history has enjoyed. And yet, here we are. Are we otherwise happy? I think finding all these things materially are wonderful. I had a great career in business and finance. I uh, had all the opportunities that uh, American culture offered, and it's perfectly fine. But for, hung for wisdom, too, we hunger. We want connection. We want something more. That invisible something more is called by many names and no names, for it's really a feeling. But I'm going to call it today for the theme of self-effort versus grace. It's not really verses, but we think it is sometimes faith. St. Paul said faith is the, is the knowledge, the knowing of things unseen, the evidence of things unseen. A life of faith builds us strength and character. And if we live in interesting times, I. Uh, well, I don't know. May you live in interesting times, and we most certainly do. I think someday history will record September 11th as a time when the rest of the world's experience has begun to impinge, infringe upon not just our shores, but on our consciousness. I think much of, much of the polarization we see today has its roots in fear. Yogananda, in predicting the future centuries, actually about 2,000 years based on a cycle of ages taught since ancient times and all the great civilizations, not just India, but Egypt and the Greeks and China, the Mayans and the, some of the American Indians, predicted that we have entered an age of great change, insecurity. He, he predicted, though he didn't use the word terrorists, he predicted that the time was coming when criminals would cause havoc on our planet and no place on earth would be safe. Well, there is a safe place, and we gathered in this room know what it is. As Jesus himself said, it is within us. The life of faith is the evidence, the knowing, the power, the strength, the confidence to know that so far as we live in the light of that which is right, we live protected. Now, I think back to my early days, 16 years of Catholic education, and I'm still here to talk about it. <laughs> Finished with my therapist. 
He's okay? I'm okay. <laughs> but I had the great awakening that so many of us did in the 1960s. Like Forrest Gump, I, was, I grew up in Monterey, California. Right down the street was the Monterey Pop Festival in June of 1967. I had my great awakening. <laughs> Jimi Hendrix, Jefferson Airplane, Janis Joplin, and Ravi Shankar and many others, yes. And so from that time, my journey began. A few years later, I went off to India in search of Secret India, if those of you who are old enough to remember that book by Paul Brunton. In my search, and we drove overland from Europe across Turkey, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, into up and down villages and temples and ashrams of India, it was a great adventure for me and I cherish it, but I was not successful. Like Toto and, uh, Toto and, what's her name? <laughs> right, like those two characters, the Wizard of Oz, I came, I had to come home. And when I came home, this is when I met Padma. But as I came home on that airplane, 30 some thousand feet over Tehran somewhere, in the dark, sprawled out on the seats back when airplanes had empty seats, <laughs> long ago, my heart shifted. Because I had been searching on my own, trying to meditate, in my case, on my own. I had deep down, you might say from my 16 years, an aversion or a reluctance to do anything but my own. But in that shift, I knew that it was time to go beyond my comfort zones in the act of faith to follow wherever my path would lead without knowing where it would lead. And it led to Padma. And she too had made a, an act of faith, living at Ananda village, the first community of Ananda of nine that exists today, India, Europe, and the West Coast. She had lost her house to a fire, a forest fire, in which 21 of the 22 homes in the fledgling eight-year-old Ananda community were burned caused by a faulty spark arrestor by the local county. Our neighbors sued the county. Our founder and dear friend who left us three years ago for a, perhaps a better place, I assume, he said, listen, we've lost everything, it's true, but we're committed to community. That's one of our core missions, is establishing intentional communities, as Yogananda predicted would be a, an increasingly common lifestyle in a world of globalization that crushes us with impersonal forces, robs us of meaning in our workplaces, when we would want meaningful relationships, a meaningful spirit-centered life. People of like mind, he predicted in the future, would gather together, not for jobs or a river or some economic reason, but through our heart's connection. And she lost her home, and in an act of faith went out to start over again, get a job, and I just happened to be coming home from India that very week of that fire, and my first job with my family, I didn't have two nickels to rub together after over a year of traveling around the world, and my father said to me, well, yeah, here's something you can do. Open this file folder. I need to hire a bookkeeper. Look through the resumes, see what you think. So I'm looking through the resumes, and I see this one gal's name, Alexandra, and uh, says they're her hobby. Her hobby was yoga. Well, hey, you know, I just came back from India. Hey, ain't no hobby. <laughs> so I said, hey, Dad, can I borrow your car keys? She had just moved. The fire had just happened. She just rented a, a house. And so the rest, as they say, is history. Now, this week at our Ananda community, where we have about 50 people living together, our membership is much larger, of course, but 50 of us live together and meditate. We have a meditation room and things like that. We've had an interesting week, a week of what I called in a note to our residents the other day, a week of reflections. Good friend of ours last week, April 27th, a year from that date, was walking on a beautiful summer day and was struck by a car that jumped the curb. 
Now, I don't know about you, but it's not like he was in a crosswalk. It's not like it was a DUI or something. A car jumped the curb, struck him and smashed him to the ground with a massive injury to the head. We all were at East West Bookshop moving it from its old location. I hope most of you have been to the new one next to Bartels and Whole Foods. We were schlepping all day, and I don't know about you, but I was beat. And then I get a phone call that my friends in Harborview. So we went there, and the surgeons said, I don't know, it's a massive head injury like this. I don't think he's going to make it. And if he makes it, he's going to be a vegetable. Well, I happened to have the power of attorney for him that he had written 10 years before, found it in a file. Now I realize what it means to do that sort of thing. But anyway, so they call us in a room, a bunch of us, Padma and others, and they say, OK, he's on life support. Are you going to pull the plug? Do you want him to be a vegetable? I don't think he's going to make it. So we asked him, well, what do you base that on? Well, we've seen other cases. What can you do? Well, neurological issues, we can't do anything. We'll just keep on life support. Brain heals itself. I said, that's not enough. My life is a life of faith. I need Divine Mother, as I call Spirit, as I call God. Divine Mother, you need to give us a sign. That's not good enough. Their pessimism is not good enough. Bit by bit, week after week went on life support. People questioned our decision. What are we doing? And then eventually, after about six weeks in a coma, with 24-7, our members and his friends coming into Harborview, praying, chanting, reading poetry, playing the guitar, the staff was very impressed and very grateful because they, they know, they knew, at least some of them knew, that that kind of energy, prayerful energy, is the greatest healing power on earth. And then one day, he woke up. And we celebrated last week for because he's, he's playing music, directing our choir. He's getting into trouble because <laughs> he's retired. So a walking miracle. Padma will perhaps tell you a little bit about another miracle that happened for our Living Wisdom School. This is the life of faith, not belief. You know, our problem with our language and our usage is that we interchange faith and belief. But faith is something much more powerful. It's the knowing, the gnosis, the knowing in body, mind, and soul that we are free that we are not merely this body. We are divine. We are something greater. Imagine if you could really believe in your own immortality. I think there was a TV show, The Highlanders or something, a really ridiculous show, I think. But anyway, these warriors thought they were immortal or something. Well, never mind them, but meditate on, contemplate someday in, in a quiet time what you, what, how your life would change if nothing and no one could harm you. That's a life-changing feeling. And to know that, that's why for us at Ananda and, and millions around the world are increasingly turning to quiet meditation, to sharpen the razor of the focus of the mind beyond the restless thoughts, to make that intuitive connection. No other tool can increase and sharpen our sixth sense, our intuitive knowing of things unseen, but which can change our life. Thus it is, encircling the globe with the practice of yoga, which is a preliminary for meditation. Why? Because we live in a time of great uncertainty. And that kingdom of heaven, of joy, of the gnosis that we are whole and complete, to walk and take steps in our faith, without knowing where it leads, this is within us. And this is my thought for you today. Padma? Let's see. Is it on? Testing? OK. Thank you. So. Um, Deborah mentioned autobiography of a yogi, and I had brought that 
with me today. This book has touched millions around the world and started them or touched them somewhere along the lines of their spiritual journey, whether it's practicing Yogananda's meditation and Kriya Yoga or many, many other traditions. It's just a very universal approach to spirituality and the inner life and developing one no matter who we are or where we are. And when um, Chris Carter invited us, you know, I think Bev didn't mention in this service, now I get your two services mixed up, but um, besides I, I learned that this is the lively service, right? <laughs> um, but we've had a partnership, Ananda, through East West. We've had a partnership with CSL to bring big speakers, national speakers here to Seattle. And it's been a very, very lovely blending of our two communities working together. And it's, it speaks to, it gives testimony to the harmony and the universal approach in our two traditions. So it's been a lovely relationship for these cousins to have. Um, and when we were invited to come, I asked what the topic was, and they told me what the topic was, and they asked me what we wanted to speak on, and in harmony with that, we selected grace versus self-effort. And that happens to also be a title in this book called Essence of Self-Realization of Yogananda's Teachings, just in little bite-sized snippets. It's very enjoyable read. You might uh, enjoy that at some point. But in any case, I want to talk this morning about grace and self-effort, of course. And I want to take us back first to, let's say, the American Revolution in the 1700s. If we were to go back in time, and if we were to talk to them about radio waves and television and wireless, you know, film something, have it broadcast around the world, parts of which they didn't even know existed, they would have strung us up. I mean, literally, they would have brought us to Massachusetts with the witches and burned us because these waves that are all around us, this wireless universe we live in, which is only what we've just discovered, God knows what else there is, is not visible to our naked eye. And so we, you know, unless you show us in some way, we don't believe it, we don't see it. And we know with just those few hundred years that these things in fact do very much exist. Well, the teachings of the East and the West tell us that the divine is at the center of every atom in creation. That means it's inside of us. That means it's in absolutely everything, everyone, and every situation we could possibly encounter. We are constantly surrounded with that divinity and infused with that divinity. And grace is the power of that divinity as opposed to lesser powers. So grace is not necessarily what's, what it's going to look like on the outside and whether it's successful or whether a miracle just happened and this special opportunity just came. Grace is the extent to which we have a connection to that, and we live in the remembrance and the conscious awareness of that divinity. You know, just as an example, Jesus Christ was crucified. That doesn't mean he wasn't in a state of grace. It's not really a pretty way for us to have to end our lives, but it doesn't mean that he was not in a state of grace. Uh, other great saints and sages of many traditions 
in the West here, a current uh, incarnation of Martin Luther King or Gandhi in the East. They were assassinated. It doesn't mean they weren't in a state of grace. So things are not as they appear. And what we want to do is learn how to stay in remembrance of that state and carry it into our day. And Riemann mentioned meditation. It's a powerful tool in that direction. There are other tools. There are many tools. But I know in my own life that it's been an extremely important and powerful tool because I have a hard time finding that razor's edge of focus in meditation. If you've ever tried it, you know that we have billions of thoughts going through all the time. When I first got to Ananda in California, I was 19 years old. And Swami Kriyananda, Ananda's founder and Yogananda's direct disciple, when he would give a talk, it would typically be about two hours. I couldn't sit still for two hours, what to speak of focus my mind for two hours. I'd go and help chop veggies in the kitchen for the lunch and listen through the, the overhead, you know, the, uh, what do you call it, intercom thing so that I could hear the talk because my body couldn't sit still for that long. It takes a lot of practice and focus to bring our mind into concentration. And then once we get that experience, we can bring it out into the day and we can keep our mind focused on our own divinity and the divinity in everything and everyone and every situation that we possibly encounter. So self-effort, notice it's with a capital S, it was on the wall a little while ago, it's with the capital S of the soul. It's our higher nature kind of self-effort. It means effort that is in the consciousness and awareness of our divinity and the divinity in all whom we touch and see, as opposed to the little s of self-effort, which is our limited ego, self-definition, opinions, likes, dislikes, and predilections, and so on. So we want to try to go for that big s of self-effort, and it takes effort. The Bhagavad Gita, the, the ancient uh, scripture of India says we cannot get out of our um, problems. We cannot rise above. We cannot experience samadhi or nirvana or blissful states unless we can rise above and act. We have to act. It's sort of did I do something bad? <laughs> it's like the thorn that it takes to take out the other thorn. You know, we have to act in order to rise above action. It's that simple. And meditation is also an action. So couple of stories. There's this one of Swami Kriyananda's brother monk when he lived with Yogananda. This man was from Switzerland, and he was a mountain climber in the Alps. And so he told the story of one day he went and he scaled this extremely tall, steep mountain in the Alps. And when he got to what he thought was going to be the top, it turned out to be a little ledge that then once he crawled over it and into it, was almost cave-like and bent around, and then bent around past the mountain, and then went up. And he knew that gravity just would not allow him to be able to climb that. He would naturally fall down each time. So he didn't have enough food or energy left to go back that long trek of many days down the mountain. And so he sat there and he thought for a while and he said, I'm just not going to starve to death here. I'm going to just try. And so he kept getting up and climbing and trying and he would get to that 
place where we're not supposed to be as human beings, and he'd fall down. And then he did it again and again and again, many, many times. And then he said one time he did it, and he felt as if a hand holding him just long enough to make it over that top. He made it. And he lived to tell about it. You can't describe, I mean, you can't define it, you can't explain it, but there it is. Grace does happen, and with grace, the impossible is possible. I know I like to share in a little way our one of, we had two children that we raised at Ananda, and our daughter, the younger one, was going to go to university at Pepperdine in Malibu, which when I took her, I was amazed to find out my daughter was going to a beach resort for college. <laughs> she had an ocean view from her dorm room, you know. But anyway, um, we couldn't afford that on our little renunciate minister's wages. So Raymond's parents uh, kicked in and helped out so she could go there. Well, Pepperdine had a rule that you could only apply for a scholarship in the window of months right before your freshman year. If you didn't do it then and if you didn't get one then, you for all four years had to pay your way. So she got to her second year. She was a sophomore towards the end of her year, and her grandfather passed away. And we knew what that might mean and did mean financially for her uh, tuition. And so I said to her, look, she was a very good writer, still is. I said, why don't you write just a one page, not longer, a few paragraphs about what it's meant for you to go to Pepperdine, what you've learned, and how meaningful that has been to you, and what has happened with your grandfather, and ask them if they would consider you for a scholarship. You know, black and white print said no way, absolutely no way. She sent that letter, and she got the scholarship. So don't believe it. Don't believe any of it. You know, if you feel that it's the right thing, just put your effort, your highest self-effort, with God, with the great ones behind you, and just move forward in faith, as Riemann was talking about, and things can happen that we just can't imagine. This week, Riemann referred to our school, our Living Wisdom School, has been renting from the Shoreline School District. They had many surplus facilities. And we've been doing that for the last six years. We have a student body of about 50 students. We have six classrooms. We believe in small classrooms. Um, and in any case, we got notice from the district that they need to reclaim all their buildings because they now have a larger population. So we had to look for a large facility, and the school district rents very economically. When we started looking around, everything, all the going rents were like seven, no, six times what we're paying currently. So it was prohibitive. And we vetted 40 different facilities. Most of them weren't the right size or shape or didn't have playgrounds or whatever. But there was one in the very beginning that we saw that was perfect. It had been a private school. It was the right size, even a little bigger than we needed. We could grow into it. But it was six times what we're currently paying, and we just couldn't do it. So we kept looking. And just about a week or 10 days ago, the woman who, and we still don't have anything, and it's May, right, almost, for the next school year. And this uh, woman who owned that private school building, she contacted us, and she said, you know, I think your school belongs in my building. She says, I've had an offer to sell it, 
from a business, but it's not a school, and I've had my heart set on it being a school. She said, are you still interested? And we said, well, of course, we're very interested, but our student body is half the size that yours was, and we simply can't afford it. That's why we didn't come back. And she said, what can you afford? And so, you know, we thought we'd be laughed out of the room by talking about what we could afford. And we told her what we could afford after much thought and prayer. And she said, keep talking. And the conversation ensued. And we ended up making an agreement that will work for us, that has it grow over the years. And any case, she, it's not about money for her. Where did, where did Divine Mother get her? You know, <laughs> where did she come from? It was not about money. It was about a school and a school with the philosophy that she loved and wanted to see more of in this world and thinks is needed. And so now she's writing up the lease. We've already agreed on the terms. She lives in Arizona. She gave us the key before we've even signed. So this is what a life of faith is all about and a life of grace. And I just, my prayer for all of us is that we can live and keep living in that divine connection ever more powerfully. Yeah. Shall we close with a prayer? Okay. At Ananda, we do spontaneous prayers, phrase by phrase. So I say a phrase, and if you feel to, to repeat it. So let's try it together. Heavenly Father, Divine Mother, dearest friend God, shed the light of your wisdom on the pathway of my life that I grow ever stronger in faith, in realization that I am thy son, thy daughter, thy child. Bless me and keep me, and teach me to be a bearer of light to all whom I meet. Om. Amen.